Just want to uh, welcome everybody here today, and uh, the governor, lieutenant governor, and Madam Secretary, and Mr. Secretary, who's on the way up in the elevator. But uh, State Representative O'Day, Senator Robin Kennedy, um, and all the chambers and all the business associations that are here, this is a really important issue when it comes to housing, affordable housing, especially how it impacts the business community uh, here in Worcester and across the state of Massachusetts. You know, we have plenty of examples. We have Tipper Talk Pie and Pola Soda, who have been here for 100 years, and uh, who need workers. Like, Table Talk Pie, a lot of the employees walk to work and they build a brand new facility. Uh, so this is a very important that we have this discussion, how it impacts the business community. We're leaders in a lot in, in Massachusetts. We're leaders in healthcare, uh, biotech, and, uh, and so this is very important as we, to our investors, people want to invest here in the city of Worcester, that they have an opportunity where their workers can uh, work right here in the city where they work in. So again, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Madam Secretary, it's good to see you. Mr. Secretary, Thanks, on man. time as usual, appreciate that. You. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, only kidding, only kidding. <laughs> but, uh, a good excuse, we visited the auditorium. Did you? Yeah, oh, very uh, cool. That's, very a, that's a great project, the auditorium. That's, yes. a, that's a winner. So uh, Mr. Secretary, Thank you for remembering Worcester all the time. Much appreciate it. And our city manager, too. I want to welcome the city manager also, so, and, uh, who's been a great leader here in the city. Thank you. Check us off. You want to say anything? Yeah, I just want to, again, I, I want to thank the governor, lieutenant governor, Secretary House, Secretary Augustus for being here. Um, you know, it's kind of fitting that we're here in, with this panoramic, panoramic view of the city because it gives you a perspective of how diverse the landscape of Worcester is. Uh, and if you look around in you know, downtown and above, uh, beyond downtown, you start to see that a lot of the landscape is being developed. There's a lot of opportunity here, a lot of growth, uh, a lot of homes, a lot of affordable homes that are being built in this community. And that's due to the efforts of the state, and the partnership uh, with the city, uh, and be able to kind of put these uh, initiatives forward. And policies like the Affordable Homes Act, the Mass Lease Acts, et cetera, are extremely important because it helps to support the municipalities and the development and the activity that we need to kind of get these uh, affordable homes in our community. Um, so I'm looking forward to this conversation with everyone here uh, because I think it's extremely important not only for Worcester but also the surrounding communities uh, as well in this central Massachusetts. So again, thank you for being here and sharing some important conversations with us. Well, um, thank you so much to the city manager, to the mayor, to all the electeds who are here today, to business leaders and, and others. Um, I'll be brief. You know, we're here because this is the issue of our day right now. I mean, this is the issue in Massachusetts. This is the thing that's holding us back. And we also have a solution. You know, we're no, we know we're down a couple hundred housing units. It's unfortunate, but apparently that's the way it's developed over the last few decades. Um, but I think what we put forward working with so many of you in the Affordable Homes Act is the ticket out. And, you know, I was, we were testifying uh, before our legislative colleagues yesterday. We're certainly uh, mindful of the, the fiscal challenges and the need to make sure that we um, act responsibly and we're committed to doing that. But we also have an excellent bond rating. We've got um, the, the wherewithal to go out and use that bonding capacity and the $4 billion that's on the table will help us immensely. In addition, it'll produce 30,000 jobs um, that we also need. We need people working right now. And so we're, we're really excited about it. Uh, appreciate the conversation today, but you know, this is, this is job one um, to, to get more housing around the state for all the reasons that you know about and that we're gonna talk about uh, this morning. Yeah, thanks, Governor. And we've, you know, so pleased to be with so many members of the business community, not just from Worcester, but frankly from around uh, around the Commonwealth, along with the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development. And I think juxtaposed uh, with our housing goals is clear economic development benefits. And we really are grateful to be here in Worcester because the mayor, the city manager, so many of um, the, the, the team Worcester approach mm -hmm. to building and developing um, strong housing agenda tied to a more robust downtown and other components of the community have really proven, you know, proven themselves. We've seen tremendous growth in housing, which has led to more vitality in many of the business districts. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to be here. You know, one of the questions we were asked yesterday at the economic development hearing was like, what's going to hold Massachusetts back? And um, we talked a little bit about that, but what's going to hold Massachusetts back is us, right? If we don't collectively get our game together around meeting our housing needs, state, local officials, 
private sector, public sector, building the type of housing we need in all the places we need it. And it is going to take a collective us. And we're here in Worcester because you all have done a really good job of recognizing that alignment and going after sort of a unified approach to building a, a more robust community. And, and we're here to listen as well as um, to generate um, both ideas and we hope incentives for communities to take a hold of this and like we can solve these problems if we work together. And so I want to make sure we direct the first question on this effort to both hear from you and, and be able to spread the importance of housing and economic development um, to the chamber. Tim, both a former mayor and a former LG, you know, Worcester's definitely seen significant growth in the economy and in the housing stock. Can you just share a little bit about how the business community and the city, you know, work together to sort of drive some of the success? Um, you have that unique position having been a local official, a state official, and now uh, representing private industry. I think your insights here could be really helpful. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll. And uh, if you'll indulge me for a moment, uh, my fellow chamber colleagues will appreciate this as well as <clears throat> the State Business Association leaders. I have two of my executive board members of the Worcester Chamber here, Dr. Sacha Meacher, who's our chair, and Sharon Fisher, who also serves on our executive board. So I want to acknowledge uh, both of them for, for, for being uh, with us today. And I was gr glad to hear you were at the auditorium. I think the governor's favorite uh, basketball player mm -hmm. used to play a lot of home games there for Holy Cross, Bob Cousy. Uh, so, uh, that, that More state officials have visited that auditorium <laughs> <laughs> due to Ed's invitation. I'm going to get it done. When that gets redone, the, the park it might be a uh, little pieces of the floor might be as valuable as the old Boston Garden Parquet. Mm -hmm. uh, Lieutenant Governor, you know, what we did it was actually about 12 years ago uh, when I had my previous role uh, working together with Congressman McGovern, uh, Mayor Petty, Craig Blaze, who leads the WBDC, and John Weaver, who's here from MBI, his predecessor, Kevin O'Sullivan, uh, we established the Worcester Economic Development Coordinating Council. And the idea was uh, all of us had a role to play, uh, though somewhat different, in the overall economic development of, of Worcester and central Massachusetts. And how could we share information how could we support each other? And then, just as importantly, prioritize the projects, the asks that would be before various secretariats, the asks that would be for, before uh, various federal government agencies, uh, and try to, as you used the, the word, align uh, our asks and priorities. And I would say from day one, we identified housing as a major issue. And I think as you look out you know, from this venue, you can see the, the results of a lot of that effort. Uh, new, you know, hundreds of new units under construction as we speak. Uh, we probably have nearly a dozen housing projects, affordable market rate, uh, uh, that are in the pipeline where the Affordable uh, uh, Homes Act is going to be absolutely critical for those coming to fruition. And so we recognize that density uh, is good for our neighborhoods, it's good for our downtown, it's economic development. So we're really excited about uh, the Affordable Homes Act. We've had a chance to talk with uh, extensively at the chamber with, 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 with Senator Kennedy and Representative O'Day uh, and our other legislative uh, leaders here locally to say this is a, a priority. They understand it and we can't have it pass soon enough because it's, uh, it's going to move projects and just as importantly get people into homes. So critical to have the business community and oftentimes our business leaders are, you know, super, um, I would say superstars within their communities. We saw it, especially our smaller business, our smaller business owners in smaller communities who they're members of rotaries, they're members of chambers, they're the folks donating to Little League and so they have influence. So I'm just, I'd love to hear from, from folks um, about how housing is important to your members. Like what level of importance does that take on and how do we get our business leaders more involved in the hard part of getting housing built? You know, all of those meetings you need to go to, all of the zoning boards. Um, it, it's really powerful when you have the head of your hospital stand up and say, we need ADUs in this community or, um, you know, we want to support an effort that might be controversial. And sometimes business leaders want to stay away from controversy. So would love to hear from, we've got a range of, of you, of business leaders here representing industries from across Massachusetts and I want to recognize that how building housing in Greater Boston might be different than building housing in Worcester or Franklin we were with the Franklin town manager yesterday earlier this week so if if business leaders wouldn't mind sharing or folks who are representing our business leaders why the housing is so important to your members and how we can really put them to work to help us go ahead JD if you want to start thank you. others please chime in thank you uh, governor lieutenant governor secretaries and to the Worcester folks for having us just 
just to share some quick data, we just are wrapping up a survey of our members, um, which will be go going public in a couple of weeks. What was really interesting was the cost of living has emerged as the mm -hmm. dominant factor in um, growth and location decisions. And what was interesting was when we, asked, we basically asked what are the factors, and we give them a list. Two years ago, cost of living was 35%. This year, it's over 80% mm -hmm. responding. So you can see like, okay, this is really top of mind. Um, it also is impacting, by the way, the ability to recruit people here. Mm -hmm. And we asked that question as well. The good news is we then asked them, we tested a lot of the stuff that you folks have filed in the economic development bill and the housing bill. And 91% said that investments in housing production, like those in the AHA, will positively impact the state's competitiveness. Mm -hmm. And then there are a few elements of the economic development bill as well. So I think what that says to us is, okay, I'm hearing 90% of our members um, are supportive of what you're doing in terms of investment. How do we engage? Mm -hmm. Right now, it's been a lot of around advocacy, um, messaging. It has mm -hmm. been a little bit less at the local level, but we've talked about how to get folks more engaged in that. But just to share, it's a little bit what we're hearing and why it's so important. It's really about recruiting and retaining talent. Mm -hmm. That's great. Not surprised. Others who might want to. So I, I, I will echo what JD said. And you know, when we're talking to members from AIM around the state, what they're really saying is it, it's synonymous. Work workforce is housing, and housing is workforce, mm -hmm. right? And I think even pre-COVID, we were able to sort of distinguish the two, and now it, it, they're they're synonymous in any mm -hmm. conversation I have with any uh, business because. Um, you know, it's about the opportunity. And I think, you know, certainly this administration, and thank you, have been out there trying to draw in, um, strengthen the industries that make our economy great. But if we can't house the workforce that we're needing, then we're at a real disadvantage. And pre-COVID, um, you know, we, we weren't even as, as employers or employees thinking, oh, well, how do I be flexible, right? You just lived where you worked and you had to figure out how you were going to get there and, um, it, now with hybrid work and remote work being such a large part of our economy, mm -hmm. and I know Secretary Howe's team has done a great amount of research on this. I think Massachusetts is still mm -hmm. the top state as far as hybrid work. Mm -hmm. um, when you have challenges as far as affordability with housing, you automatically see people shift their behaviors in a way that we didn't see pre-COVID. So I think that also probably feeds in to the, some of the data that JD has seen because now people have new opportunities, new decisions they can make. And so again... Governor, to your point, the, the problem we're at here has been happening for a while, but the critical need to address it is more so than ever mm -hmm. because COVID has changed everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank I you. wonder if I could jump in as well. And it, as it turns out, this was the panel that testified on the housing <laughs> bill, the three of us. So uh, I guess we go uh, uh, one after the other. But uh, first of all, let me congratulate you for being here. Um, I've talked to each of you um, about the uh, housing issues that the Commonwealth faces, and both of you have said the same thing. It's about every resident in every region of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. So I congratulate you. Uh, I want to congratulate you for having this conversation in the heart of Massachusetts uh, in, in Worcester. So uh, uh, thanks for that. Um, J.D. is always great at bringing the data, and I'm the anecdote guy. Uh, <laughs> so um, my anecdotes are that um, I am fortunate to have uh, 20 CEOs of the largest companies in Massachusetts. Um, I don't work for them uh, individually on their uh, own company. I work on their collective interest in a stronger Massachusetts economy. And as we get together and talk about uh, the issues of the day, uh, housing keeps on coming up mm -hmm. amongst those CEOs. Um, one CEO um, at, at our last board meeting said that he is trying to bring more jobs here to Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. We're in a national and an international competition for employment. Uh, the world has opened up. Uh, people can work from almost anywhere, and, and investments are flowing where it is easiest to have that investment flow. And this CEO said, I have difficulty getting higher-end talent to come to Massachusetts because even though they are making lots of money, they look at the cost of housing here. If they can find it, they look at the cost of housing here, and they have a uh, sticker shock. As that discussion was happening, and many people around the table were shaking the head, another CEO jumped in and said, well, I need to talk about uh, others, not the, the highest paid, but the ones that we value the most, the younger people in our organization, who someday will be the highest paid in our organization. And they're telling us that they can't afford to live here anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it is a business imperative. It's, it, it's, a, 
it's a community imperative, it's a business imperative, it's a family imperative, it's a state imperative that we all come together. Again, I want to thank you for um, for bringing us all together. And if I could just say one other thing about our, our host community here, and it's great to see everybody from Worcester. Um, all of us have traveled around gateway cities. Um, this place is special. Uh, mm -hmm. People uh, work together. Uh, there's a sense of being able to get things done. It's the second largest city, not only in Massachusetts, but in New England. Craig, this is my speech tonight. I'm speaking before the WBDC. <laughs> previewing it here. Feel free to change anything you want. What strikes me about Worcester is the, the issues that you're addressing both in your housing bond bill and in your economic development bond bill. There is so much opportunity here to create housing, housing that people want to live in and a community that people want to uh, be part of. The problem is that the cost of the infrastructure, and I'm talking not only about the traditional infrastructure, but the cost of cleaning up property, the cost of taking down old factories is so significant that the private sector just can't make the numbers work. And so that's the role for the state, and you all have recognized in the filings that you've made before the legislature, and I'm sure the legislature uh, will take up this session, the need to provide for assistance in order to make the investment so that the private sector can then come in. And when I talk to private developers, I hear that all the time. My friend Jonathan is uh, shaking his head from uh, Pittsfield as well, and any other gateway city. We know that, Mayor, you know, uh, Lieutenant Governor, former Mayor, you know that uh, from um, Salem, and I, uh, I know that from Chelsea. So uh, congratulations on doing that. It's an imperative that we get uh, those funds to you so that you can turn around and work with Eric and others uh, to be able to get control, as Craig does, uh, for properties, uh, scrape those properties, clean those properties, make sure utilities come to those properties, and then the development community is going to come. Greg, I know Greg and Peter as two local chamber directors have representing different regions have been all over housing. You were for housing before housing was cool uh, uh -huh. in our business communities, and so definitely want to hear from each of you um, what you're doing, what you think the impact is to the businesses if we're not building enough housing. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, Governor, and everyone. So it's the, the, the bond bill, the economic development bill are really critically important and deserve our support, but there's another battle that's happening inside our cities and towns that needs specific attention. You know, we need to make sure that our town meeting members and the communities there understand that if you're frustrated by how long it takes to wait in the, in the ER room, if you're frustrated you can't find a place to care for your children, if you're frustrated there's no senior care for someone in your life, if you want to know why the grocery store shelves are empty in the afternoon, and if you want to know how long it takes to get your latte, it's because we don't have the, the staff mm -hmm. and the places for our people to live to hire and retain our workers. Mm -hmm. And we need, only businesses can develop that message. Housing advocates can talk about the need in general to help people and environmentalists can talk about that, but only businesses can do that. And, and actually with respect to this group, I'm glad it's an honor to be with these colleagues, but we also need a strategy to get to those small and mid-sized chambers so they know how to do this mm -hmm. and empower the business leaders on Main Street to talk about it and empower the people in the healthcare centers to do that. And I have specific ideas about how to do that. We'd love to chat offline about it, but really this is a battle town by town mm -hmm. and we need a ground game on the business side that matches the ground game on the, on the upper levels. I know just the person to lead that, Greg. Excellent. Um, <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the South Shore, because Peter, you know, there are also some infrastructure challenges that we heard about at a housing forum um, that you helped sponsor. And maybe just share with us some of your business community members, their thoughts on housing and how we can address it, knowing that um, it's a, it is a challenge in every region. So some of it, our members has been educating our members. Some of it, They'll, they'll come to through personal experience of their kids not being able to, to stay in the state, not being able to get workers. <clears throat> but for a lot of people, they're busy running their businesses. They have to uh, understand the connections. Our work began about seven years ago, uh, and probably our, our greatest success has been in changing the discussion mm -hmm. and, and reframing the questions. When we uh, started on a big housing initiative seven years ago, it was gonna be project by project and town by town. And it was less about housing as sheltering. It was almost always framed as housing, as economic development and mm -hmm. community development, uh, helping revitalize areas that were underdeveloped or abandoned, taking advantage of uh, new growth for uh, both existing businesses, but also to support communities. The challenge we had in 
uh, perceptions on the South Shore, and we may be similar to some suburban areas. The South Shore exploded 50 years ago from the urban flight back in the 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. And that growth was so profound, it did create uh, municipal burdens. Mm -hmm. And the people who moved down uh, from the city to the mm -hmm. suburbs remembered the burdens they imposed on the towns and don't want to have it happen to them now since they've never moved out, but their kids have. So we've, we've changed the discussion that it's about economic development. Uh, we've battled the old perceptions that new housing growth adds considerably to municipal burdens. Um, and we've had some great work uh, in research from Mass Housing Partnership, Donahue Institute, Mike mm -hmm. Goodman and Mark Melnick and those people. Um, and so we, we've been able to start driving home the fact that families aren't formed the same way they used to be uh, or in the same growth and that housing uh, often is a net gain to municipal budgets. Mm -hmm. Uh, some help with school officials who said they're losing population and if it doesn't come back up, they're going to have to cut services. So reframing the discussion has helped a lot. Uh, a lot of our success, though, has come from picking our town partners. And mm -hmm. that's been less uh, you know, genius insight from the business community, and it's more from some municipal partners coming to us saying, we get it, we want to do the right thing, but we need business support uh, in order to overcome their own internal uh, political fights with their volunteer boards and, and that. The real challenge we have is, uh, as Jay mentioned, it's infrastructure. For us, it's going to be water and wastewater. And the other is municipal decision-making capacity outside of mayoral forms of government uh, because we are seeing professional municipal leaders, the town managers, the town planners, understanding the importance, but the decision-making within their own municipal bodies is tough. So to that extent, hmm. the housing choice bill mm -hmm. a couple of years ago started to chip away at that by reducing the thresholds. The MBTA housing Mm -hmm. does that in a different way by starting to take away zoning authority from towns. So I think the challenge, um, and this is probably going to be on you, Lieutenant Governor Moore, because you were a mayor, so municipal <laughs> officials kind of respond to you differently. Um, and I don't know how you're going to get around to all these towns. <laughs> uh, but trying to figure out long-term for entire economic competitiveness how you can streamline decision-making in municipal forms of government that aren't mayoral uh, government. That, that's going to be a tough challenge, but I think that's what it's going to take for housing and a lot of decisions for economic competitiveness. So I've actually given that you. challenge to Ed um, <laughs> as the former. Um, so as part of the housing bond bill, we do have two committees that are actually working really hard. One is unlocking potential, trying to understand what are those barriers, how do we overcome them. Secretary Augustus is chairing that. And we also have a, a statewide housing production uh, plan that we're hoping to put in place. I'm chairing that committee. We want cities and towns to have their own housing production plan. The state has never had one. What's our goal? How do we track how many units we're creating? What are the opportunities in, in every region of this commonwealth to grow housing that fits that region's needs as well? So we're, we're trying to be smart about how we grow. I often talk about development by choice, not by chance. would be really good for communities. It's really good for the commonwealth. Paul, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about the Cape, because I think there's just such an intersection between the, the business community as a, as a former mayor of a tourism community, restaurants not being able to fully open, long waits, not having the type of staff that you need, the type of level of service that you might be used to, and yet still not always getting the support for housing in a community, even when it's that close. And I think the Capes really tried to work on how do we regionalize number of number of different towns, obviously also has then the seasonal challenges like the Berkshires with lots of folks having second home. So a little more unique in your neck of the woods. Yeah, on, on the Cape, uh, the housing situation hits a little bit differently. 37% of the housing stock are second homes. Uh, almost 30% of the workforce comes over the bridges every day. Mm -hmm. And in a recent survey by the Cape and Islands Board of Realtors uh, of registered voters, so people that were 18 and above, a third of, of people that responded that were born and raised on Cape Cod are currently living with family. 
So that's wow. how how dire the situation is. So it's not it hasn't been difficult to get the board focused on housing as our number one issue. Uh, boards even come out and specifically endorse the transfer fee local option that's in the Affordable Homes Act. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, so we're looking at what we can do. We have a heavily seasonal economy, so we're looking at a seasonal workforce as well as a year-round workforce. Mm -hmm. On the seasonal workforce size, we rely heavily on foreign-born workers mm -hmm. in J-1 and H-2B visa holders, uh, especially on the J-1 side. And uh, since the pandemic, the, the sponsoring agencies have, are now requiring employers to provide housing, which is, has caused a 3,000-person dip in the number of J-1 students we can get there uh, for the summer season. And so the chamber has now brought on a J-1 housing coordinator that is helping to uh, to get that host network formalized mm -hmm. and to help grow that host network so we can maximize the existing infrastructure that we have. And we're starting to look at a hotel-motel conversion process now to take some of the underperforming uh, hotel motels and convert them into um, housing for seasonal workforce, but there are still challenges with towns on that. But as it relates to the year-round workforce, uh, you know, you have to be a family making over two hundred twenty thousand dollars a year to even think about getting into the market, uh, residential real estate market on the Cape, um, if you can find a home. Uh, and but we need uh, nurses, for example. I mean, Cape Cod Healthcare is em employing per diem nurses at three times the cost yeah. uh, of what it should, what they would pay a, a regular nurse. And we're, we have an actually a, a good RN training program at Cape Cod Community College, but those are very portable degrees. Mm -hmm. So we're actually training people for jobs that we need, but they're going someplace else. Mm -hmm. um, so that year round, what we're looking at are maybe the option of a regional housing trust that could buy deed restrictions for year round residents. We're looking at developing hopefully state or municipally owned property with long-term sort of ground leases to take the, the, the land cost out of development. Um, but all of it, we're, and we're also working with uh, a not-for-profit called uh, Incremental Development Inc. Dev uh, to come into these communities, create cohorts that uh, they do what they call gentle density, which is to take you know, commercial properties that are, are not performing now and turn them into housing. They train people how to do that. But we still need to build. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the 15 towns on the Cape, in the last election cycle, there were several select boards and town councils that were flipped to uh, a majority of, of people elected that believe in zero growth. Mm. Even though zero growth always brings ultimately social and economic decay, that's what they're, they're holding on to. <laughs> uh, and that's been the most difficult part of, of moving forward in a meaningful way on the Cape. It's interesting to me that we still, as local leaders, aren't always recognizing the benefits of growth as well, mm -hmm. not just meeting the housing needs, but the capital needs in terms of additional revenues for mm -hmm. communities mm -hmm. and patrons and customers to have that thriving downtown. You know, I know Franklin at one point was one of the fastest growing communities. This goes back into the 90s when there was a big expansion of single family homes. And we had the Franklin town manager with us just earlier this week talking a little bit about the work that's there. Would you just mind sharing the intersection between the business community as a, as a town that had a lot of growth and had to build new schools to meet it? It was tricky for a while in Franklin, but it feels like to me there's been an embrace of where do we build the type of housing we need when we need it? Sure. So my name is Jesse Dean. I'm the executive director of the Franklin County Chamber of Commerce and Regional Tourism Council. So we're actually separate from the town of Franklin, although here it's lovely. Um, so we're about an hour and a half drive west. So we're right before the Berkshires. Um, and Franklin County is actually one of the most, it's the most rural community in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. So we have a population of 70,000 that's sprinkled across 26 towns. I like to say we're Ann Gobi's neediest child. <laughs> um, but uh, what's important about Franklin County is that 65% of that population is over the age 55. Mm -hmm. So while there are a lot of compounding issues that challenge rural communities, what keeps me up at night is our population loss projections. How about, how, what's the percentage again? 65 percent of, of 70,000 people are over okay. age 55. So over the next 20 years, so it's enough. estimated that Franklin County's population will decline by 10 percent. That is catastrophic for a community of 70,000 where the tax base is 75 percent residential. It's a challenge. Um, and Ready for growth. We're That's ready we're for saying. growth, okay. but we know that one of the largest restrictions is housing. Mm -hmm. So I hear it every day from our business community. We want to be competitive. Um, we know that we need a larger, 
workforce. We know we need larger employers mm -hmm. with high paying rates. Otherwise, our regional economy and the health of our municipalities is at significant risk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anecdotally, I had a meeting yesterday with an employer that recruits nationally and they cover the cost of relocation and they cannot fill the positions because they just, we don't have the housing to support it. So w one of the statistics that I think is most concerning is that uh, Franklin County is losing population at the rate of roughly one person per every eight days, while the need for our housing increases one household every five days. So, of course, that's because housing sizes are smaller. So it's, you know, an elementary school word problem way to make the point that even though our population is decreasing, our need for housing continues to climb. Mm -hmm. I think what's also challenging is that... Um, 68% of our houses were built before 1970. So mm -hmm. we have aging infrastructure. I won't get into the challenges we face with sewer and water treatment and all of the other infrastructure culverts that challenge our ability to you know, make our towns what they need to be. But 53% of uh, a percentage of income goes to cost of living. And that jumps up significantly when you include the cost of transportation. Mm. So ultimately, while we love gateway cities, what we need is something that's specific to rural regions. We need something that's specific that incentivizes developers to come in to make developments that are communities at size. Obviously, they're smaller, they're a little more costly, but they're well worth it. Jesse, do you, do you, um, I'd love to hear from both you and Jonathan, who are probably in more of the more rural communities in, in both of the places that you represent. Do you have ideas for strategies, uh, that we could put in place with the business community? One of the struggles we have with building housing anywhere is it's just not penciling out. It's not penciling out in greater Boston, given some of the uptick in costs. So it doesn't cost less to build in Franklin County, and yet, you know, oftentimes the the rents are a little bit cheaper, which is a good thing in many respects in terms of what in what people right. Even where housing is more affordable, it's not more affordable to the people who are there. And so, is there are there some strategies we should be thinking about in terms of working with the business community? The hard work of development is assembling the parcels, putting all of the pieces together to make it as easy as possible for the housing to be created. And I'm just curious if you've had those sorts of conversations with local business members. So I think, and it's been said here already, I think the business community is very much on board. Mm -hmm. They know that they're restricted by the lack of housing. Mm -hmm. I think it falls to municipalities. So we, most of our towns are run by volunteer select boards. Um, and I think they're still stuck in the thought process from 30 years ago that growth is bad. Mm -hmm. um, so I think honestly, housing needs a rebrand. And there needs to be some type of statewide um, education around how we change policies and bylaws to account for ADUs um, and how we prioritize housing-based developments as opposed to, you know, um, you know another, another business base. And we can do rezoning. Um, I think that's really where the challenge lies. Love it. Thank you. Jonathan, you want to add uh, a little bit of your thoughts relative to how things are currently this data play in the Berkshires and ways that we could work with the businesses there as well? Sure. Um, and thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I So uh, very similar to Franklin County and also some parallels to the Cape, obviously rural regions. So I would say to your original comments around, you know, how do we better engage the business community? I think in the Berkshires, they're engaged, you know, mm -hmm. uh, through our organization, through our business roundtable. Um, there is a, there's actually a lunch group of about 10 CEOs and we meet every Friday for over Zoom and we talk about housing because <laughs> mm -hmm. it's that, it's that much of a yep. crisis state. And that really is the number one priority in our region. Mm -hmm. um, and they're willing to go to town meetings, go to zoning board meetings, go to planning board meetings and, and, and speak to the need for projects moving forward. Um, in terms of our region, so uh, we love the Affordable Homes Act. Um, it, it addresses a whole swath of issues where there's either underfunding or there's a lack of programmatic uh, firepower, um, and we're, we're we're strongly advocating with our delegation and beyond and the committee chairs, uh, you know, to move that forward as quickly as possible. For us, though, it isn't just affordable housing; it's also market rate housing. Mm -hmm. um, the Berkshires has struggled with population loss for a half century. We've lost 20 to 25 percent of our population since the early 1970s, and what we've run into now 
is um, it, while the 2020 census was the closest thing we've seen to um, signs of a plateau, which we're excited about um, in some time, um, we now have tremendous pressure because of a huge lack of market rate housing in the region. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, we're losing um, a professional population that we've recruited, and we're losing a, a, a locally born population that can't grow into the workforce because mm -hmm. they can't afford homes, um, and there's no, there's no uh, rental market mm -hmm. in terms of uh, market rate housing. Uh, a couple different things that we've been focused on are, you know, we love the HTIP program in Pittsfield. It's been very successful. I think Pittsfield is probably a banner community for utilizing that program, but we only have one gateway city in the Berkshires out of 32 communities. And we have another seven or eight communities that, you know, have populations of between six to 15,000, um, urban cores, you know, all those, it, those issues an urban community deals with. And we don't have any housing incentive programs to catalyze market rate housing. And they're nice communities to live in, but we just can't get market rate housing online. Mm -hmm. um, another issue that we've looked into, and I've, I've spoke with, uh, just about everybody that will listen over the last decade is uh, just the regulatory complications around the 30% threshold of triggering fire and ADA. Mm -hmm. um, those are good policies, but the way that they trigger quickly um, in communities where real estate is valued at a lower level than in some other places is a disadvantage to housing development for us and throughout the Berkshires. And then the last piece that we've kind of been honed in on is, um, you know, we have an aging population much like Franklin County. I don't know exactly if our percentage is that extreme, but it's, it's certainly over 50% is of that age. And for us, um, we don't have suitable uh, senior living uh, facilities mm -hmm. for the population that is willing to to move out of their homes and you know move into you know communities where they can engage with their population and and have the resources they need. And as a result, it's affecting us in two ways. We're not serving that community properly, and we're not opening up and we're not opening up existing housing inventory for young families and professionals to move into. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate that, and also the the sort of misalignment around how do we get the housing we need, uh, given the populations and the demographics. And those were those housing production plans can really be a vehicle, at least for calling it out, and obviously the support for local officials. I'm wondering if we can hear from some of the business leaders who are here, Dr. Mitra, um, Ms. Fisher. Any I, thoughts you have in terms of folks who are actually trying to recruit individuals to come to work, who are on the front lines, oftentimes trying to be as successful as you can running your business, and then also having the challenge of trying to attract the talent that you need? Yes, um, <clears throat> Sharon Fisher, Fisher Contracting. Um, you know, as a local Worcester business, and you know, both uh, minority woman owned. I prioritize having a diverse workforce, and I think it's been one of the biggest struggles for me. Uh, about 80% of, uh, of our laborers and carpenters are probably renters, mm. and I think renters face the biggest challenge when it comes to affordable housing. So that's been scary, just being here in Worcester, trying to hire local folks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> First of all, governors, uh, Lieutenant Governor, it's very nice of you to come to Worcester and make this happen. I think it's uh, very admirable that you have chosen this uh, this city and brought in all these community leaders as well as your associates to discuss this important topic of affordable housing and economic development uh, which comes with it. I'm especially honored because my office is also in this building, so oh. I feel a little bit special here. You have the shortest commute. That's what that means. <laughs> well, you know, the elevators are so slow that it takes longer time. <laughs> However, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I read a lot about the affordable housing and the challenges that we all face here uh, and the community in general. I think there are many people who do not understand that how important it is and they will have a lot of objections from the community that uh, old, old, old homeowners uh, are probably thinking that you know that it's going to be crowded, it's going to be dense, it's going to be a lot of traffic, it's going to be crime rate, and a lot of different kinds of challenges that people feel, which could be the hindrance for you know putting this project th uh, through uh, successfully. So I, I think there's some kind of education to the community is needed, that how important it is to understand this affordable housing is a must for us. Mm -hmm. This issue is important. So community in general should be educated about it, I think. And, uh, and another thing that I have always felt, being a tax consultant in this town and being, that being my profession, I, uh, I've looked at and I thought of this various times that Massachusetts is probably one of the very exceptional states that you know, our tax laws does not give much advantage to homeowners to have any kind of benefit. Mm -hmm. If you look at the tax codes that we have, having home doesn't give us any advantage in Massachusetts or those taxpayers who mm -hmm. live in Massachusetts. Most other states follow the federal rule. 
So they get the advantage of taking the mortgage deduction, property tax deduction, all those. Us, we don't have. We have just standard deduction. That's all you get. Hmm. So I think trying to analyze that fact that uh, giving that advantage of deductibility in your taxes probably could be uh, making some things a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Making people understand that, you know, why it is so important for us and giving some incentive there. So I think that's something I have always thought that I think we should kind of analyze and see, is this going to be of benefit to us? Just like uh, charitable donations, you know, Massachusetts would allow charitable donation only if we could do it in federal. Now, because of the itemization has become difficult, most people cannot take the charitable donation on the federal side. But Massachusetts this year made an exception that even if you cannot take it in federal, you, we will allow you to take the deduction in the state. Equivalently, I think, if the housing expenses or the mortgage, the property taxes, which are not of much benefit in the federal anymore because the standard deductions have gone up so high, I think if we can make a little exception for mass taxpayers, that we will allow you to some extent deductibility of the mortgage interest, property taxes, it could make things a little easier to run through the housing project or the affordable housing. So that would be one suggestion that I'd like to make. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know, um, I want to make sure I hear from my own uh, chamber region uh, in the North Shore mm -hmm. because we are in the midst of the MBTA Communities Bill and a m number of communities on the North Shore are fit within that greater Boston, either our T communities or adjacent communities. And in your former life, you'd be covering all those town meetings, Karen. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm just curious your your thoughts on how the business community might be able to play a, a larger role and, and frankly how we can push out information. Every single one of you is now engaged in housing and that may not have been the case five or ten years ago. Right. And I think there's an opportunity for us to make sure we're speaking sometimes in a unified and aligned way. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, pleased to be here with both of you. Uh, no one knows the North Shore better than Kimberly Driscoll, of course. Uh, and regarding the MBTA communities, I would say that Greg is doing incredible work mm -hmm. uh, on that and is a real leader in that area. Uh, you may want to speak more about that, but he has a great program that he's created that can be rolled out through other chambers as well, particularly the smaller chambers. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, regarding education, I, I won't... Um, I, I do echo all of the comments, of course, about the need for workforce housing. Uh, the North Shore Chamber, we had a really interesting, great program recently that was one of our most well-attended and also uh, greatest feedback. And we invited four local developers who came and spoke specifically about transit-oriented mm -hmm. housing projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, really got in-depth about each project, how many how many units um, are being created? Where are they being created? What is the economic impact on the downtown, on the community? What's the impact on the roads and the schools? And so it was real a real educational opportunity for those in attendance to say, wow, these are great projects mm -hmm. and these are truly going to have an economic impact on the region and on our workforce development because people will be able to afford to live there and use transit to get to and from work mm -hmm. and other spots where they need to go. So mm -hmm. that program was really successful and we plan to recreate that at least quarterly to try to continue that education process. I love it. I think both transit-oriented development, supportive housing for senior models, there's a lot of innovation coming out in the housing space, and Massachusetts is leading it. And I that will also be an effort to stop sort of villainizing developers. We all live in a house that somebody created. Mm -hmm. We obviously need a lot more affordable housing. We need market rate housing. We need housing for our most vulnerable mm -hmm. members. How do we think about that in a in a construct? And Secretary Augustus has spoken to this, I think, really admirably about the different types of housing you need mm -hmm. when you're 20 versus when you're 80 and everything in between mm -hmm. um, and abilities for us to help educate through your lens. It's one thing when we're saying we need more housing. It's a whole different, uh, it's a whole different filter when you you and your business leaders are saying we need more housing. And also, 
how that housing, bringing those folks to live there impacts the local business mm -hmm. community. Totally. Because now these folks are walking downtown yeah. to get a coffee or to go to the, you know, the, the restaurants mm -hmm. and the local retailers. So it was a great way to um, bring those projects forward as success stories and then say, and here are some others in the pipeline. That may be something that can be replicated. Let's take it on the road with other chambers. I want to make sure I allow um, both Secretary Howe and Secretary Augustus to say a few words about the work that's underway, maybe some of their takeaways from this conversation and the work that they're seeing and, and the things that we're doing every day. And then we're going to probably end up wrapping it up. Ed, you want to go first? Um, sure. Just I, I think everything we've heard today is what we've heard consistently uh, from across the state. There's commonalities for every region in the state that there's housing pressures. Some of the solutions are going to have to be unique to different parts of the state. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do with the Affordable Homes Act is to craft unique sets of tools that can deal with the unique pressures that are in different regions, whether it be seasonal communities uh, in the Berkshires and, and Cape Cod, uh, supportive housing, office conversions in some of our gateway cities and core downtown areas, um, as well as we've got a, the governor and lieutenant governor have asked us to come up with a rural housing initiative, uh, which we're working on now because we know there's a very unique set of challenges in our rural communities, and we've got to put some unique tools together there. So um, I, I appreciate the advocacy that you're all doing. I do, Tim knows this, uh, you know, the world is run by those who show up. Uh, mm -hmm. And so much of this battle is now happening at a town meeting, at a board of selectmen, at a zoning board. And we really need everybody to show up at those forums because that's where the battle's uh, taking place. And we need to bring fact uh, and data to these discussions. And I do think business leaders have unique uh, credibility in these spaces because you don't typically see them at these forums. So when you come and say, hey, if you want us to be able to continue to have that bank in town that you all count on or that healthcare institution in town that you all count on, we need a workforce that can afford to live here. And, you know, I say it all the time, three years ago, the folks who worked in cleaning hospital rooms and nursing home rooms or, you know, in grocery stores, we called heroes. Mm -hmm. Well, those heroes need a place to live mm -hmm. in every one of these communities to make these communities work, and that's really what the Affordable Homes Act is about. So, so true. Yeah, no, well, I always love coming to Worcester. I talk about Team Massachusetts, but Team Worcester really always um, does an incredible job of working together across the business community and, and everywhere. Um, so we, you know, it's interesting. We just t testified yesterday at our economic development uh, bill hearing um, with many of you, so thank you for being there. And sometimes we get this question, or I get this question often of saying, um, well, we have this $4.1 billion housing bond bill, and now you have another $3.5 billion economic development bond bill. How can we afford all these things in which we have to choose one or the other? And I think our legislators is, are very, very smart, and we know these are one and the same. We need both. It's, this is an and both issue. And so I always talk about how housing is the number one priority across every region. I spend a lot of time across um, all of your different areas, and it's universal. Large companies, small companies, every type of business, we need more housing of every type. And we need economic development to create awesome jobs and to invest in these communities and these, um, these uh, you know, companies and to drive growth. So these things go hand in hand. So it's really great to be here with all of you, and it's very consistent, the messaging. And we're so grateful for all of your voices being part of this topic so we can hopefully work together with our awesome legislators to get this passed for our state. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, I, uh, I'll just, just say a few closing arguments or a few closing <laughs> comments. <laughs> Not arguments. We are not arguing. We are not, we are not arguing with anybody because I think there's a lot of alignment in this room. What we need to uh, really try and work on collectively is how do we turn this into collective action in our communities. Um, I do think the um, that you all are the X factor in sort of doing that myth busting mm -hmm. on the ground, helping educate, helping us put together all of the pieces that we know we need to when it comes to developing the type of housing that we have. And we need champions in every community. There needs to be somebody who's willing to get up and say, wait a minute, let's talk about how we get to yes when it comes to housing, not no, and let's not start out on the 10 yard line. If there's any ability to engage in that, I think a lot of your members can help do that. And we wanna stand ready to you know, support those efforts. So I wanna make sure we thank you for being here, for the work you're doing every single day. 
to not only help strengthen the economy, but make sure we have the housing for those folks who are so critical to our communities and to the private industries that we want to support, being able to live here, grow old here with respect and dignity, and raise their families here. And that's really at threat right now if we don't figure out how to meet the housing demands in this commonwealth. Gov, I'll leave the final words up to you. Yeah, I just, you know, I actually do think of it as a closing argument um, because we need to press this case right now. There's the issue on the math, and I think what we've said to Secretary Augustus is we want the HLC team to have a new look at regulations, processes, ways of doing things, because what worked is not what meets this moment always. So that's the first thing, and he's empowered to do that, okay, and, and work with town planners and others on that. So I just want to acknowledge that is definitely part of what we've got to do. The other thing we got to do, though, is deal with – you know, a situation, look, last night, town of Marblehead, okay? They put out flyers. There was an organized effort there, laden with misinformation, I'd say disinformation. Mm -hmm. You know, it was four, it was, I don't know, 40 vote differential. Uh, close. It was close. But that's the stuff we've got to counter, mm -hmm. okay? And that's why I appreciate the efforts around, you know, boy, it's just, it's a joy for me to be here with our fabulous LG and secretaries, and you know, I get the benefit of working with them every day, to work and to listen to all of you. You guys know, you know, you're so smart, you're out there, you know what we gotta do, but we gotta do this now, working together, so I, thank you. Yeah, huge sense of urgency, and uh, we're counting on all of you to work with us to achieve the type of success we need in this space, so thanks, appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.